We were furious about the past presidential election of a man whose presidency would eventually end in disgrace with his impeachment for obstruction of justice. After firing the person running the investigation into him at the Department of Justice. But here's what I want you to know. We got through that tumultuous time. Welcome back to AM Joy. It was the Hillary Clinton her supporters have been waiting for. Clinton unplugged at her alma mater, comparing Donald Trump's win to that of former President Richard Nixon, who had just taken office in 1969 when Clinton became the first student to give the Wellesley commencement address. This week offered even more signs that the current president has tried to interfere with the FBI's investigation of Russia's meddling in the 2016 election. An investigation that's now looking at Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, as a person of interest. Among several bombshell reports in the Washington Post, just in the last few days came news that Trump made separate appeals to the director of national intelligence and to the director of the National Security Agency, urging them both to publicly deny the existence of any evidence of collusion between his campaign and the Russians. Both men reportedly refused to comply. Joining me now is Evan Siegfried, Republican strategist and author of GOPGPS, Richard Painter, former chief White House ethics lawyer under President George W. Bush, equal rights attorney Tamara Holder, Paul Butler, professor of law at Georgetown, and MSNBC justice and security analyst Matthew Miller. Thank you all for being here. So I want to go through and I want to start uh, Paul Butler with the definition of obstruction of justice. And this is from Cornell Law School. It says that obstruction of justice is defined as whoever corruptly or by threats or force or by any threatening letter or communication influences, obstructs, or impedes or endeavors to influence, instruct, or impede the due administration of justice. Uh, and it says persons are charged under this statute based on allegations that a defendant intended to interfere with an official proceeding by doing things such as destroying evidence or interfering with the duties of jurors or court officers. In your view, does Donald Trump doing the following things. This is element three for my producer. Sorry, I'm jumping around. Asking Jim Comey to pledge his loyalty to him, then firing Jim Comey with, the, with uh, Jared Kushner's push to do so um, after he didn't do it. Asking the DNI to certify there's no collusion. Asking the NSA director to certify there's no collusion with him in Russia. And then reaching out to Flynn to say stay strong when, that, when Flynn is a person of interest. Does that look like obstruction of justice according to the statute, Paul Butler? As a prosecutor, I'm looking at a pattern of conduct. Corruptly impede an official proceeding. Corruptly means you know that what you were doing was wrong. Well, you know what you're doing is wrong when you're meeting with the FBI director and you ask the vice president and the attorney general to leave the room so you can have a private conversation about give my boy Mike Flynn a break. You look at a pattern of conduct where, again, you reach out to the intelligence directors to give Flynn a break, and they say, no, we can't call off the FBI. And then you go to the FBI director. He says, no, I can't do that, and I can't show you any loyalty. And then you fire that director, and then, Joy, after all of that, you know Flynn is under investigation. You give him a call, and you say words to the effect of, man, I know the feds are after you, but keep your head up. The struggle is real. Give me a break. I've seen obstruction of justice convictions on less evidence than this. And Matthew Miller, you also have sort of extraordinary uh, information coming out of some of the officials who were the, the, the uh, sort of recipients of these overtures from Donald Trump. Admiral Mike Rogers uh, addressed the staff of the National Security Agency. This is unusual for information like this to come out, unusual for him to do this full sort of briefing that would become public. This was in The Observer. Uh, Admiral Rogers took the unusual step of addressing the entire NSA workforce to tell them what transpired with the president. Rogers report, reportedly admitted that President Trump asked him to discredit the FBI and James Comey, which the admiral flatly refused to do. And he stated, there is no question that we, meaning the NSA, have evidence of election involvement and questionable contacts with the Russians. That's extraordinary, Matthew Miller. It is extraordinary, and we've seen the president obviously call uh, the director of the FBI. We've seen him call the director of the NSA. We've seen him call Dan Coats, the, uh, the director of national intelligence. I think the big question about other people who might have called, you know, two people who haven't talked about their interactions with the president yet with respect to this case. One is Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, and one is Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general. It's hard for me to believe that with the president being so angry about how this case was being handled, that he was calling uh, the, the people in the intelligence community, that he also wasn't calling Jeff Sessions, his friend, 
maybe his closest ally in the administration, and complain to him about how the investigation was handled. And that is key because Jeff Sessions and Rod Rosenstein obviously both signed off on the firing uh, of Jim Comey. So I think one of the questions we're really going to have to ask, and it's going to fall to to Congress to ask Sessions and Rosenstein when they're up there in their regular appearances, what conversations did they have with the president? What conversations did they have with other people in the White House? And if he was complaining to them about the way Comey was handling the investigation before he fired it, I think that is, a, is, is another piece of evidence that goes to his intent in, in making that decision. And Richard Painter, you know, David from, uh, you know, I was on with him uh, on the last word the other night, and he made a, what I think is an important point, that we are framing this as legal versus illegal rather than adding the, the question of whether or not these things are even baseline ethical for a presidential administration, regardless of whether you're able to prove the crime of obstruction of justice, that as a political and ethical matter, these are, are problematic. You, as former White House Ethics Counsel, would you have ever, ever authorized a president of the United States to even do one of these things, namely usher the attorney general out of the room so that the president could have a private conversation with the FBI director who's investigating his campaign? Absolutely not. Uh, this is uh, a clear evidence of obstruction of justice. We've also had several administration officials lie about their contacts with the Russians. And now we hear that administration officials and the transition team uh, were trying to establish a secret uh, communications, encrypted communications with the Russians. And all I can say is that if uh, President Obama's transition team had tried that, uh, President Bush's uh, team would have made sure they got locked up and they would have told the president-elect you could pick up your men on Guantanamo Bay on January 20. I mean, this is treason. There's a violation of federal law for uh, uh, people to be uh, communicating encrypted messages, negotiating with the Russian government uh, before the president takes office, I am amazed uh, that anyone on Capitol Hill is tolerating what is a combination of obstruction of justice, Russian espionage, collaboration with Russian espionage, and now uh, violations of the Logan Act. A, a very, very serious situation for this administration. And, and, and Evan, it does beg the question, where are the resignations? Where is the outrage on Capitol Hill? Richard Painter makes a good point. If anything even close to this had happened in the Obama administration, Republicans would have immediately begun impeaching the President of the United States. There is no accountability. Let's be honest. President Obama was very smart in that he never met directly one-on-one -on -one with the FBI director, be it Director Mueller or Director Comey. He always made sure to have somebody else in the room. That's because you have to ha preserve the integrity of both the FBI and the presidency. The president himself has not preserved the integrity when these investigations have come up. He's talking to uh, uh, Dan Coats. He's talking to Mike Rogers. He's got to be talking to CIA Director Pompeo, begging them to do their job because they serve him. He funded fundamentally does not understand the role of the president. The president has hiring and firing power. It cannot say, I want you to go out and investigate this or that and stop investigating this. But, I mean, Tamara, it's more than that, not just talking to them, but according to this, this John Schindler piece in The Observer, encouraging the National Security Agency director, the head of the NSA, to discredit the head of the FBI, to discredit James Comey. I want to play for you what Richard Nixon did that almost got him impeached, that got Republicans to walk into the Oval Office and say, Mr. President, you're going to need to resign. It was literally him attempting to get the CIA to interfere with the FBI uh, with the investigation of Watergate. Let's listen to Haldeman. This is his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, on June 23, 1972, in one of those Nixon recorded calls. But the way to handle this now is for us to have Walters call back Greg and just say, stay the hell out of this. This is a uh, business here. We don't want you to bring it further on. That's not an unusual development. You know, Tamara, in, in a sense, even the, the level of outrage on the Democratic side that is not going directly to calls for impeachment is a little stunning. You have a few people like Maxine Waters who are saying it, but do you think that at, at this point we have enough evidence that there is a serious crisis in the presidency, many orders of magnitude more serious than we had with Richard Nixon? 
Oh yeah, what, what Richard Nixon, what the TV just played, what he did is child's play compared to what we're seeing here. And if you look at, it, we're talking about crimes here, but you always want to, you, you want to know intent. And the intent is clear. And the intent is, is that Donald Trump has significant business dealings in Russia. That's not just making things up. It's true. We know it. He's said it. And the people around him have had significant business dealings around Russia or with Russia. And now the news is just this week that his own attorney, he is now hiring outside counsel, who, guess what, not only just threatened to sue the New York Times twice this year, but now he is representing the biggest savings bank, Spear Bank, in uh, a Russia Bank, um, a, in a, co a corruption case in the United States for hundreds of millions of dollars. So every single person that Donald Trump chooses to associate with himself has significant business ties to Russia. And that is why we need to be very concerned. It's not just the crime, but the intent of what he and the people around him are doing and the reason why he doesn't want to get rid of them. And not to mention considering hiring Joe Lieberman um, to be his FBI director who works for the firm that is partnered by his lawyer, his personal attorney. Paul Butler, uh, how much jeopardy is Jared Kushner in given the new revelations about his months of dealings with the Russians to try to set up back channels? Uh, Joy, Jared Kushner has two choices, both of which are problematic. He has said he's going to talk to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Well, the choice is now he could take the fifth, and I don't see how we have someone working as a top aide to the President of the United States with access to all kinds of secrets taking the fifth, or he can tell the truth. Now, what he said is that he just forgot about this dramatic meeting where he asked the uh, Russians to let him use their spy channels to have conversations that he didn't want the government to know about it. That cannot be true. If he tells the truth, uh, I'm concerned that he faces criminal exposure. And Matthew Miller, should Jared Kushner lose his security clearance? You know, I, I'll tell you what would happen to, to a, a regular person in government if if they were caught anything close to this, having a meeting they didn't disclose and then having this secret channel, they would at a minimum have their security clearance uh, suspended while the FBI investigated it. Um, that's what would happen to anyone in the Justice Department, anyone in the CIA. But it ultimately comes down to the president. Uh, the president will get to decide what happens to Jared Kushner's security clearance. And I think we have to ask, will he be treated like anyone else or will he be treated like the president's son-in-law? And, son and I think, unfortunately, we know the answer to that question. And, and, he well, won't last, be treated like others. Last question to you, Richard Painter. Is there anyone in this, in, in the, currently in the federal government that is even capable of holding this administration accountable? Because even Jeff Sessions, the uh, Attorney General of the United States, is part of the club. Well, uh, I was in Washington uh, two days ago speaking with some members of the House of Representatives, but so far only the Democrats uh, seem to be interested in this. And this is a, a big tragedy for the Republican Party. I've been with the Republican Party for uh, 30 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I got to say, I remember the Nixon uh, 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 situation, and he, he may have been a crook, but at least he was our crook. Uh, he was not in bed with the Russians. Yeah. We didn't have to worry about the national security of our country in the Nixon era. Amen. Uh, Evan Siegfried will be back. Richard Painter, Tamara Holder, Paul Butler, Matthew Miller, thank you all. And coming up, the Republicans' war on the poor. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.